BioBalance HealthCast episode 232, Insulin Resistance and Breast Cancer. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin. And today we're going to be talking about breast cancer. Breast cancer is a concern for all of us, women who are susceptible to it and men who love women who are susceptible to it. So it is a thing that we need to know more about. It's a thing that everybody's afraid of and reasonably so because it can kill you. Uh, And it comes up a lot as a question in terms of the treatment that Kathy provides at her office, BioBalance Health. When she focuses on hormone replacement, a lot of women who have had breast cancer really take some uh, strong inquiry when they come in to say, can I do this safely if I have a history of breast cancer personally or in my family? And other women will come in and say, will this lead to or increase my risk of breast cancer? And so today we're going to talk about various things that we know and don't yet know about breast cancer. And I hope you find it to be informative and interesting. So mainly when patients come in, they all they've heard is, the only risk factor they've heard of is estrogen causes breast cancer, right. okay? And so that is something that has been publicized and is kind of this, if you avoid this, you won't get it, right. which is simply not true. There are so many other factors that have to do with increasing your risk of breast cancer. In fact, this new article that we that we are speaking from today talks of, it's from the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, and it discusses the research that's being done on insulin resistance, which is prediabetes or hypoglycemia or that all of those things kind of name the same thing, which is a high insulin level and high and, and high going to high from high to low blood sugar levels and the resistance of the cells to accept insulin and blood sugar we've talked about this before mm-hmm. so it bounces off the cell the blood the cell is starved for blood sugar but the body is making fat out of it because it doesn't know where else to go so as we age that's a normal part of the aging process then that our cells begin to be more resistant to absorbing insulin as we lose our hormones, testosterone and estrogen, right. we become more insulin resistant. So okay. both women with both of those hormones and men with testosterone, as they age and lose their testosterone, they become more insulin resistant. That causes them and us to gain belly fat, to uh, have blood sugars that are initially low with high insulin levels, and then later it, they develop into diabetes. Some people get obese, some do not. But the fact that we have uh, lost our hormones Mm -hmm. and started aging increases insulin resistance. So So this is what they're looking at in this study. Insulin resistance, and meaning high insulin levels, actually doubles the risk of breast cancer in women who are obese or not obese. So that means most of us, after menopause, and even before that, become insulin resistant, and we're doubling our risk of uh, breast cancer cancer. with that. Now, estrogen doesn't double the risk. In fact, estrogen doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer. When uh, the WHI study came out, it was really the progesterone, the Provera, that increased the risk of breast cancer, not the estrogen. So that was a misinformation that made everyone panic and go off estrogen. Estrogen doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer. Just think in our lives, the time that we have the highest estrogen is before menopause pause and when we have when we're pregnant we have we have a huge amount of estrogen when we're pregnant and that's not when most women get breast cancer mm-hmm. in fact that's rare to get breast cancer when you're pregnant so so it's not about the estrogen it's about other things and one of the other things that is huge and you can actually do something about has to do with insulin resistance if you decrease the carbohydrates in your diet If you exercise, if you take supplements, and there are some medications that decrease um, insulin resistance, all of those things will decrease your risk of breast cancer. I mean, not your risk, but your wife's risk, our risk. So uh, there are 
those are the things they're finding out when they used to just globally say, don't take estrogen, it'll improve your risk. It didn't improve the risk in WHI study. Yeah, that, that study came out and actually they released their conclusions before they had done all the statistical manipulations. That's right. Because they were afraid of what they had seen. They wanted to get the word out right away. Oh my gosh, there's this link between breast cancer and estrogen that has appeared in this study. And so then that became sort of the standard level of awareness for for the American society, women, doctors, uh, news media, everybody was quoting the study. But it wasn't estrogen. And it wasn't. It and was the estrogen and Provera. That was the only arm of the study that was stopped. They didn't know that for a long time. They, they didn't it. acknowledge that. They didn't acknowledge and it. And society has still not updated their perception. Every so often when we talk about different studies that have been released, the people that are writing about those studies refer comparatively back to the WHI study and say, mm -hmm. well, but this said that. And they don't understand or accept that that's been completely rejected mm -hmm. as, as an invalid study. That's right. And the conclusions nope. are false. Even doctors that I know very well yeah. don't, don't Still, because don't they get learned it, it in school. Or they learned it, or they learned it by watching television themselves. They didn't really read the study, yeah. and they didn't see all of the all of the retractions. But this study is really more important. This study is saying if you don't have estrogen, if you don't have testosterone as you age, and that puts you at risk for insulin resistance, then you eat too many carbohydrates, then you stop exercising. Then all of these things, and alcohol, alcohol increases risk by a lot. It, it just independently has nothing to do with this, although it does increase insulin resistance. So we found lots of other things that we can do something about to stop uh, or, or decrease our risk. The issue is here, it's what we eat. It's what we do. It's how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. It's something that we can't change our genetics, but we can change this. Well, but the study is actually a study from the National Institutes of Health, and it's reported in the U.S. National Library of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they say is that it's more than obesity. I mean, they, they start with a measure of uh, BMI, and they say 25 or more mm -hmm. it is where they put a marker point to study the data. Mm -hmm. Women who are postmenopausal, who have a BMI of 25 or more, mm -hmm. uh, and have a high level of insulin resistance, mm -hmm. are much more likely to develop breast cancer. As a matter of fact, the study says women who are both overweight and insulin resistant have an 84% greater risk of breast cancer than overweight women who are not insulin resistant. So the, the point to be made here isn't that you're overweight, and that's certainly a concern for so many reasons as you age. If you maintain obesity or, or more than what you ought to have weight levels, you affect your bone structure, your muscle mass, your fragility, your balance, uh, so many things, and you open your body to so many other disease impacts. So if you can drop some weight, that's helpful. But just, I mean, enormously helpful, I don't mm -hmm. mean diminish it, but just dropping weight doesn't necessarily protect you. The, it, you have to know what your insulin resistance factors are. It's just your insulin level and the, this study doesn't state the exact insulin level that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. In the anti-aging community we're looking for a fasting insulin. It doesn't do you any good to do an insulin after uh, that's just random. You have to be right. fasting for 8 to 12 hours. A fasting insulin of 7 or less is what the anti-aging community says. Now, on when you look at the lab test, it doesn't say fasting, not fasting. It just says up to like 20 something is okay. That's because they're not limiting it to fasting right. and they haven't updated right. their yeah, values yeah. to the newer studies. But if you're looking at your own insulin level, you wanna have seven or less when you're fasting and you want to have a normal glucose level and you want to have a normal hemoglobin A1C which measures the three months of blood sugar that you've had and the last thing is a normal triglyceride level. Oftentimes triglycerides can be just genetic, everything else is normal, but oftentimes it goes along with prediabetes and diabetes. So when I see somebody who has never had a high triglyceride level before, mm -hmm. who is coming to me after 40, they have a high triglyceride level, 
then they also have slightly high glucose they also have a high insulin level that's when i'm going to start talking to them about diet and exercise meaning diet low carb not low fat not low calorie low carb diet and and exercise every single day she does too because she I, I'm, harasses I'm, me about it when my triglyceride yeah. level goes up even though my glucose level didn't go up but she says you gotta stop eating this stop eating that start that's because we fixed more. you and now you know you eat yeah, a few things and then you exactly. can't you have to be once you're there you have to maintain and that's the hardest thing because it's hard to to not eat like the rest of america which is way too much and way too much carb and way too much sugar it's hard not to eat like everybody else she'll, but, call, she'll call my wife and say slap him when he reaches for those potatoes and actually <laughs> oh my gosh i do <laughs> <laughs> i confess yeah. i confess but you know that's because if i say it to my husband i'm a nag yes uh, stop eating those Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> and, and Phil says it to me. Plus, I don't absorb. I mean, I don't absorb that information, so I don't internalize it. My wife absorbs it, and and not when it's about you, you. Yeah. So I'm appreciative of the support and help. Most of the so time. you always have should have somebody watching you, kicking you under the table when yeah. you're eating something that you really shouldn't be eating. Somebody who loves you and wants you to remain healthy and without breast cancer that, and without diabetes. That's if you're like me. If you're not like me and actually have self discipline and intelligence, then you can monitor your own. Consumption. And nobody's as, perfect, as my wife says. You don't have to be perfect. When we go out to eat, they put it on the plate. They don't put it in my mouth. Well, that's so a good. So she leaves, you know, because restaurant portions are so massive. Yeah, well, we in, could in just United share States. portions, but we don't because we then don't. we're cheap or we're or. But I like to just bring them home and have them for dinner the next yeah. night or something else because you just don't have to eat it all. And, and so that's like a surface level phenomenon that we tend to focus on, but the underlying question is for long term health maintenance. Monitoring what you eat and the and the consumption of triglycerides of carbs, of carbs. Of things that turn into fat mm -hmm. is something that we need to be increasingly aware of as we age. That's right. And this study confirms that it's not well it doesn't say it's not estrogen, although there's a lot of other studies that say mm -hmm. that. But it's the aging process that makes us insulin resistant and then it is our lifestyle that kind of slows down as we get past menopause or right. andropause that actually sets us up for this. So I think one of the things people need to think about mm -hmm. is sit down, how can you exercise every day? Yeah. Are you going to, I mean, you don't have to have a stair stepper. You can run up and down your stairs in your house or in your, where you work, mm -hmm. or, you know, you can do that for 20 minutes. I mean, that's, you that's know, there, exercise. There are so many things that are known to be helpful. One is put your fork down. Most, when you're full. most Americans don't. No, put it down between bites. Well, that's true. Men in particular and do that cock foot. and load mechanism. You know, they, <laughs> they load it and cock it here while they have a mouthful. Shoveling. When it washes down, they shovel them in and cock and load again. <laughs> put the fork down. Put your hand in your lap. Chew your food. Swallow it. Look around and see if there's something to be said. Then take another <laughs> bite. If you slow down that process, we know that psychological hunger takes about 20 minutes to satisfy. Mm -hmm. And you can cram a lot of food in in 20 minutes right. if you've trained yourself to just, you know, like being a member of the Clean Your Plate Club. For God's sake, parents, if you have children, do not require them to clean their plate. That's and, But don't feed them in between meals. Yeah. You know, don't let them eat snacks instead of real food. Teach them. It's hard. I mean, it's don't really force them to hard. Eat, to be respectful. You have to watch them all the time. There are starving children <laughs> in China. I always wanted to say name two. <laughs> but I didn't because my father was hand-fisted and quick-reflexed. Yeah, yeah. So, but... <laughs> The way we bring up our children is the way the re next generation is going to eat. And if we bring them up on fast food and we bring them up on eating in 10 minutes and not chewing their food, eating it whole. What you model, how, um, you, how you live it. I mean, Kathleen the, Parker has an article, uh, an editorial in the paper today about giving up alcohol uh, in her, whatever she is, late 40s, mm -hmm. early 50s, uh, because she's come to realize that she, no matter what she said to her children about drinking and drinking consumption, that she modeled Right. Having wine every day. Wine was okay in her social class because it wasn't right. beer or whiskey or anything. Right. It was just wine. It was delicate. It was refined. It was educated. sophisticated. And she said one of the things that, that, that struck her was when her son was setting the table, set milk glasses for everybody but mom, put a, put a wine glass in her place. Mm -hmm. So she said, what am I teaching? Well, and that's, and you know, that's a common thing that I talk to my patients about. And, and I have kind of a middle class, upper middle class upper class uh, population in my practice yes. and they all drink wine 
while they're making dinner. Now, wine was really meant for Wine was meant originally to be drunk because water was not palatable, it was not clean, it was not safe, and wine, because the alcohol in it, was killed a lot of germs. Killed a lot of germs. So exactly. you didn't get the diseases or the parasites you might get from uh, regular water. But, but in addition to that, it was meant to make you hungry. Hmm. Eat more, because when you eat a carbohydrate first, which is what wine is, it's plain sugar, then it's just like eating a, a, br a brownie or a donut. You know, just if you think of it like that, you may not do it, but if you do that before you eat dinner, you're hungrier, you're going to eat more. I always make a joke about uh, I want to eat dessert first in case something happens. Mm. What you're telling me is I should not eat dessert first. I'm telling you you shouldn't eat dessert, but that's okay. That's you. <laughs> oh, you, food. Nazi. I know, but yes, yeah. I am. You know, insulin resistance. Well, but 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 that's the point, and mm -hmm. and that's where we need to come back to. We're talking about insulin resistance and the effect on your body in the aging process when you can't process sugar, mm -hmm. and especially as it relates to breast cancer, because right. you, you want to make the case that there are a number of different things that contribute to the increased risk of breast cancer. Not mm -hmm. just, uh, it's not at all testosterone, but people mm -hmm. make the claim that it they might do, be They do, but it's not true. But that there are things that people have some control over, can do something about. But they don't want to, to hear that because they love drinking wine and they love eating candy. Yes. The problem, I mean, one of the ways we try to decrease the risk of our patients getting breast cancer is to offer them weight loss programs. Now, mm -hmm. hormones, testosterone especially, in the way we give it, should give you more muscle and help you lose fat, but it doesn't do it all by itself. Mm -hmm. So we offer for the people who can't get into eating properly, exercising properly, we offer low carb diets, exercise, and this a weight loss program basically with medications. But so many of them come in with great ideas, but when we say, or great great motivation, they, we say, but you can't drink alcohol while you're on this, and then you have to add it back slowly, because you'll once you're down, once your weight's down, you'll see that when you drink a couple glasses of wine every night, it'll, it'll start coming back, and then you'll see that that's the key. But you have to stop drinking wine while you're on your weight loss program, and they go, not going to do it. Yeah. I mean, seriously, yeah. that I'll, is the holdup. Now, I'll put why 10 would more wine minutes on the treadmill so that I can have? But that's a glass not going to work. I mean, it's not ten ten minutes on the treadmill is not going to do it, mm -hmm. especially when you're having wine every night while you're cooking dinner and getting hungrier and eating more, and that just that just breeds eating more carbs. So, when women women won't get up, give up their wine, or they won't decrease it to like a half a glass or a little a taste of wine, which should be enough while they're cooking, I know, then well, no, well, if they won't give it cooking, up, then they're just yeah. setting themselves up for breast cancer. Well, and to make it, make <laughs> because it clear, you're not opposed to people drinking wine I, No, no, but, I drink wine, but not those every night while I'm drinking making This dinner. issue of insulin resistance mm -hmm. or, or the risk of breast cancer or obesity, and, and remember the combinations of being overweight and being insulin resistant. Right. That's Add that to alcohol consumption, you increase your risk. And that's the point you're trying to drive home. That's right. That's right. And they've done studies that said alcohol consumption increases the risk of breast cancer mm -hmm. alone without looking at insulin resistance. Right. And now we're saying insulin resistance, which is hypoglycemia and a poor response to blood sugar, is something that uh, causes breast cancer. So there's, you know, we've seen all these studies, and we we need to hear them instead of just going, oh. I'm not going to take estrogen. Well, that's not going to help. It's going to help if you stop doing these certain habits or save them for special occasions. There's no reason why. Yeah, it has to be an everyday. It has to be an everyday habit. At risk of an addiction. Right, but I'm not. I'm not worried. I mean, th my concern in this, in this, in this moment, health in this cast example, yeah. and with my patients is not alcoholism. That's not what I treat. And and truly, people who want to come in and get healthier mm -hmm. usually are not consuming so much alcohol that I would consider them alcoholics. No. Because and, and the thing earlier in the podcast we're talking about is that uh, you can have insulin resistance at any age and any weight. That's right. But as you get older, you are more likely to develop insulin resistance. And after menopause... That's why women have so much of this and have so much diabetes. After menopause, you're more insulin resistant than you were before. Right. So if you were on the edge, then it can throw you over to diabetes. Right. 
and not everybody gets checked every year for their blood sugar. I check my patients. They if they agree to come in every year for just a health check, I check them for that. Check right. them for insulin levels. Make sure that they're doing well and that they're following an appropriate diet. But so many the only thing I can't get them off of is wine, which is just kind of blowing the whole the whole insulin resistance problem. They still have it if they still do that. So when you and your women friends or the women in your life are sitting around talking about breast cancer and the risk of breast cancer, increase the level of the conversation to be more than just breast cancer. Talk about insulin resistance. Talk about obesity, exercise. I mean, don't talk about it in a way that's assaultive or accusative, but talk about it in a way that says, I'm concerned that we do the most that we can do to take care of you for the healthiest life that you can have, so you'll stay with me, which is what I want. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.